Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Peter's. So good to see all of you. I could think of no better place to be on a Sunday morning to be right here worshiping our Lord and our Savior. So part of that, I have a few announcements this morning. First off, Sunday school. Join us today for a free ice cream social happening between 9 and 11 o'clock in the crossroads. You can meet your teachers there as well, as well as by spirit wear. Regular classes for Sunday school will begin next week. Church picnic today, yay! From noon to 3 o'clock, join us for food, fun, and fellowship and children's activities, including a petting zoo, from noon to 3. Service of prayer and anointing. We'll be putting hands on and praying for people Sunday, September 17th at 1230. If you have any need of prayer, please come and join us for that service. Harp concert at, here at St. Peter's Saturday, September 17th, Caesar Cedeno, who is a very, very accomplished harpist, not only will play classical music, but other selections as well. Please come and join us at 6 p.m. New Bible study and sermon series, Red Letter Challenge on Serving. This is a wonderful and excellent sermon series and Bible study, and it will be starting in October. The Bible studies will be on Wednesdays in October. On September 11, 2001, the course of American history was suddenly changed. We remember the chaos and the confusion, the destruction and the heartbreak, the shock of 3,000 lives lost in a single day. But we also remember the great resolve of everyday people, the acts of heroism that brought us together, the men and women who stood in the gap, somehow still fighting, giving every ounce of strength to help others. Decades have passed since that historic day, and in that time, we have learned that despite all the suffering and loss, our God remains faithful. Even when smoke and debris obscure our paths, His unfailing love will carry us through. As we remember those who were lost, let us honor their memory with our lives, giving our own strength to help the hurting, making sacrifices for those around us, and sharing the faith which brings eternal hope and peace. This is our promise and our prayer for 9-11. Let us stand now and greet each other in the name of the Lord. Yeah.
We begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, from whom all proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We see it for the Old Testament reading. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, Consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, 
his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh the king of Egypt and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand now for the I'll you first. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put it in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. This is the gospel of the Lord. Join me now as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may now be seated for the sermon hymn. At this time, I want to welcome the kids to come forward for the children's message. So if they want to join me right up here in the front on the steps, it'd be good to see you guys again. Anybody notice? Well, maybe not, but getting a little bit darker earlier, meaning the sun doesn't rise quite as much as early as it used to. Things are changing. We've got a lot of good things going on here at St. Peter. Did anybody notice there are people out there with their jerseys on? We've got some Lion fans out there. I saw some Illinois fans out there, University of Illinois. I've seen some Michigan fans out there. Do we have any uh, Michigan State fans out there? Am I seeing any of those? All right, got a few of them out there. Okay, all right. And the best one, though, we got a Green Bay Packer fan out there for sure. 
wearing the green and gold, and we're always proud of that because those are the liturgical colors, right? We see it right there at Manchus. All right, it's good to see you guys as we kick off a special Sunday today. This is traditionally what we call Rally Day. I often refer to it as Kickoff Sunday because it happens to happen on Kickoff Sunday for the National Football League as well. And I realize not everybody likes football, and that's okay, that's fine. Not everybody likes sports, that's okay too. But have you ever noticed how fans will dress, how they will act, how they will cheer on their teams? Have you ever seen that? I mean, I had somebody actually give me this because they knew I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. They thought I should have this football. Can you believe that? What kind of football is that? It's a Lions football. I don't know what they were thinking, right? But you can see up here, I also, I'm going to cut right through. If you guys are okay, I'm going to walk right past you, all right? If you look right up here, you can see that I even have a Lions jersey. This is the only Lions jersey I own. I was forced, and I mean forced, to wear this about five years ago in church. Can you believe that? All right, but I kept it as a souvenir. That's a, a Matthew Stafford uh, Lions jersey. He's playing for another team now, but there's the thing. But I just want to point out once again, these colors do not match at all, all right? These colors do, and this is my team. See, here's the crazy thing. We'll do things like that. You look at us, we're proud of this, and I'm not saying it's wrong. But we will, and I will, literally put on the shirt with another man's name on it. It's amazing what we'll do as fans. We want people to know the team that we follow, right? We'll tell people about it. If somebody comes up, like Charlie over there, Mr. Russell, who, who is our organist, wonderful guy, but he's a Bears fan. We're trying to fix this whole thing. Can you believe that? He, he roots for the Chicago Bears. But at the same time, we make it known who our allegiance is toward. In fact, sometimes Packer fans, I know you guys are waiting for this, will actually wear the fact that they are Green Bay fans by donning the cheese head. This is actually my son's. I don't own one of my own. But it's amazing what people will do. But here's the thing. What we're going to talk about this week and a couple of weeks afterwards is how important it is that we make clear that we're not just fans of the teams that we follow, but we're more than fans of Jesus Christ. We're followers of Jesus. And how is it that we wear him? How is it that we show everybody that we're actually on his team? We're going to focus on that because it's important that we do demonstrate to the world who this Jesus is and that we're more than fans of Jesus. We are his followers. Would you pray with me? All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for choosing me to be on the best team ever. Lead us with your Spirit to show others that we follow you. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead back. And I will tell you right now that uh, when that church picnic was being planned, I... More than on more than one occasion, I went through and looked at my calendar to make sure the Packers were not playing during the, green, uh, during the church picnic. Now, that's not new because I was, you know, in Wisconsin for many, many years. My wife was born and raised in Wisconsin, just an hour south of Green Bay. Uh, and as we uh, have talked about this so much, they really do show, no matter what kind of fan you are, what allegiance is really all about. That's really the point we're going to focus on today as we begin this new series titled NFL Necessities for Life. Because whether you wear the blue, whether you wear the green and gold, whether you're wearing other colors or whatever your favorite team is, it's important that we always remember who we are. In fact, there's a reason that I will often do things like this. I don't just bring up the Green Bay Packers just because I'm a fan. I mean, I've seen fans that are, are bigger fans than I'll ever be when it comes down to it. But the reason we bring this up is because of exactly what we just heard with the kids. People will do some things, whatever it takes, to make sure other people know who their allegiance is toward. Have you noticed that? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I stayed up on Thursday to watch that whole game, and I was pretty excited, probably not as excited as a lot of you. 
But it is awesome. And as I was watching that game, I'm watching some of the fans in the stands, mostly red, but occasionally somebody in blue, and not just in a shirt, not just in a hat, but they're, they're decked out. I mean, people will do anything when it comes to especially football games to show their allegiance. Some will actually paint their faces. Some will actually go so far to wear special clothing that they have set aside in a special section of their closet. And I'm not lying, that goes on in my house too. We've got the special section of all the, all the uh, sportswear and everything else. And some, some will do just about anything you can imagine to make clear that they are fans of whatever team they follow. In fact, about 10 years ago now, in fact, I think it was 10 years ago or close to it, uh, back in Wisconsin, fans were pretty excited and proud of the fact that Forbes magazine announced that they could claim the title of being the best fans in the National Football League, at least at that time. And that's right, it was right there in the article. In fact, after a little research in and around cities that are hosts to NFL teams, market researchers actually found that at the time in Green Bay, 84% of adults either watched, listened to, or attended a game in the previous season. They also discovered this, and I quote, they also discovered that it seemed that little else went on to compete for their attention, and anything that did revolved around the team. That's a telling statement. It's a powerful statement. It's a little bit of a frightening statement to say that everything that goes on in a particular city like Green Bay basically revolves around the team altogether. But as it sounds, it still paints a pretty accurate picture. I mean, in the years that I served as a pastor back in Wisconsin, where I served most of my years as a pastor, I can tell you that rarely, if ever, we even discussed having the remote possibility of a, a meeting or something like that during a Packer game. That's right, we never ever held meetings, special events, or anything else during a Packer game. In fact, I'm still convinced that if the church were burning down, people would have voted to go, we'll get back to it after the game. I'm pretty sure. The bottom line is, is that it was serious stuff. In fact, in my early years as a pastor, I still remember having a discussion with, with the elders and the council at one particular church because the Packers were gonna play on Christmas Eve. And it wasn't easy as a new pastor to take a stand and say that we are not going to change our worship times for a football game on Christmas Eve, even though I really didn't want to miss the football game. But I will say this, it did reveal the dedication of fans. And while this is admittedly unhealthy when it comes to our spiritual life in some ways, I suppose it really does demonstrate what allegiance can really look like, what allegiance is really all about in the way that fans often talk, the way that they live, even in the way they dress. And again, you don't have to be a football fan or a sports fan at all to take notice of what goes on. I mean, maybe that's why Forbes was then bold enough to actually go so far to compare the Green Bay fans and the stadium, Lambeau Field, to the church. That's right, it's right there in the article, which is actually a little sad because when it comes to any football stadium, college or pro, the people that fill those venues, they often do prove that Forbes magazine has a point. I mean, think about it this way. Look at it from this perspective. I mean, faithful fans, they regularly flock to stadiums or huddle around the TV every single week. Faithful fans will even go so far again to dress a certain way, similar to the way that maybe some of us were years ago taught to dress for church, where we had church clothes or church shoes. And I think it's honestly safe to say these days, and it goes for me as well, that some fans may take more time picking out what they're going to wear before a game than they do for church. It's pretty easy for me to pick out what I'm wearing for church. And that's, if that's not enough, then consider all the traditions that are followed, the liturgical structure, if you will, that's followed when it comes to football games and stadiums and fans. Fans will not only wear the jersey of a team that they don't play on, but they'll wear the jersey of a, that it dons another man's name. They'll wear a shirt that will make it clear who they are. They'll even cheer, they'll chant, they'll scream. They do a lot of praying, and they will sing. They'll share what's on their hearts and minds, whether or not you want to hear it, and they'll even defend their team and their coach until they are blue in the face, which I suppose fares well for Lions fans, right? 
Fans will hang banners in their homes, on their homes, on their cars. They'll display evidence of their support everywhere you go. Some people will even go so far to permanently mark their bodies with a tattoo to make it clear of what team they actually support. That one has not happened in the parsonage, not yet anyway. But one thing's for sure, it does not take long to notice that faithful fans will do just about anything and everything to demonstrate their allegiance by revealing their hearts. Which brings us really to our question for today when we talk about allegiance, especially as we kick off this NFL Necessities for Life sermon series. What do people see in us? Can others see in our actions and in our lives that Jesus is number one? Can people see that Jesus comes before our possessions, before our retirement plans, before our families, before our teams? Can they hear that Jesus comes first in the things that we say, the things that we talk about? Can they see it in the way that uh, we set our priorities? Can others see it in our dedication to learning and growing in his word or in how much we value then the opportunity to do what we're doing today to worship? Let's put it this way. If we put as much time and effort into being a Christ follower as we do uh, as fans of whatever team it is that we follow, what would that look like? What would people see? Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't wear a jersey. I'm going to be wearing my jersey all day long. I'm not sh saying that you shouldn't be a Lions fan, no matter what those misleading Bears and Vikings fans try to tell you. But we're here to once again be reminded by God through his word that there's something so much bigger, so much more important, and even so much more life-depending than our love for our football team or any other team. And that's our allegiance to the one who has demonstrated an allegiance to you and me like no other. That's really the focal point of today's message that when it comes down to it, it always comes down to Jesus. And it comes down to the love of Jesus that's been poured out over us richly. And the same love that we've now been called to live from the inside out, to exhibit, to reflect, to speak, to wear. And it's the love that Jesus is talking about. It's this love that we actually hear him referring to in that lesson that we just heard from, from Revelation chapter 2. See, you have to understand that uh, as Jesus is speaking here and giving these words to John the Apostle, he's actually directing these particular words in verses 1 through 7 to the church of Ephesus. But they're also geared toward us today because they are eternal. And as he does, he not only commends the church of Ephesus for some pretty awesome things, but he also has something else to say to them. Now again, I think it's really important to emphasize the church of Ephesus as Christ followers, they were actually a pretty awesome group of people. They weren't a, a shady group of people, or it wasn't that they would have uh, appeared to be falling completely away from God as followers. Uh, not at all. The church of Ephesus as a whole, they remained, uh, uh, it retained some pretty awesome characteristics as a fellowship of believers. And they even did so while enduring some serious, serious persecution. You see, under the evil dictatorship of a ruler by the name of Domitian, who, by the way, claimed to be a god, these fellow believers were facing an ultimatum. Either redirect and share some of their allegiance of God with that Roman emperor, and therefore acknowledging him as a god as he wanted to be acknowledged, or they would face some serious and even life-threatening consequences. That's why often when we speak of persecution, uh, we have to remember that the persecution that we uh, often uh, either, e either feel or feel like is going on around us really doesn't often compare to what they were going through in Ephesus. And they were going through some big things, things that could be life or death situations. But I will say this, it does make me wonder, when we get back to it, would Jesus commend us for the same things for which he commended the church of Ephesus? If Jesus were to send us a message right here, right now, 
Would he go so far to commend us for our, our works, our toil, our patient endurance? Would, would God commend us for recognizing and having no tolerance for those things that are evil, for those who are evil, for, for those who falsely deceive and mislead, for not growing weary in the midst of, of everything that we face in our day-to-day -day lives? I mean, would Jesus commend us too for standing firm on the truth of his word, not the words of this world or what we think or what we feel? And would he commend us for putting him first in our lives and everything we say and do? Would Jesus commend you? Would he commend me for demonstrating a faithfulness and an allegiance to him that is more so evident than our allegiance to, let's say, our favorite team? Would he commend us too for cheering on our teammates as they face the day-to-day -day battles on the field of play on which we live and work? And does Jesus see in us what we often see exhibited in diehard fans, people who never waver, who stand firm during trials and temptations, who speak and hold fast to the truth, who remain faithful to, uh, in all circumstances, who even go so far to sift out all the lies and the deceptions that the opponents try to sell? Will Jesus find in us people who are following and honoring that first commandment? to put him first in all things. Ah, always comes back to that first commandment, to love God above all things. It's a tough one. And yet we know that our God and our love for God, it should always be tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold of what it is for any team that we cheer on. But you see, there's something else though that we need to consider in all this. If you aren't already a little bit depressed by now, there's also this outstanding issue that Jesus made clear with the church of Ephesus. See, while the Ephesian Christians were commended for things that I know that even I often fail to do, there was something else that Jesus still took issue with in regard to who they had been called to be as followers. That's right, if you aren't already overwhelmed by the weight of God's law and, and what this is already all about, when it comes to loving God first, there's still this point about living out that love. That's a big one to throw into the mix of everything we're talking about as a follower. I mean, as we read through these verses and read through verses 2 and 3 of this section of Revelation 2, I mean, it's awesome to hear how faithful the believers in Ephesus were in the midst of everything they faced. But according to what Jesus goes on to then say, even they were falling short which makes this whole Christ-following thing still hard. It's true. There's still this big issue that Jesus raised with his people and still raises with his people, and it has to do with that love, not just love toward God, that's big, but also love toward one another and living that love from the inside out. You can see it in what he has to say. In fact, you find it in verse 4 where clearly Jesus is not one to lower the bar, where pretty good isn't what it's all about, especially when it, we're talking about being all in as a follower of Jesus. Because while Christian qualities like that of hard work and perseverance, having no tolerance for that which is wicked, testing false apostles, doing all that faithfully by proclaiming Jesus as Lord are all highly commendable and all a part of who we are as followers, there still remains that new commandment that we're called to live from the inside out. That new commandment that Jesus emphasizes to his people then and now. And it has all to do with the love that we're called to live. In fact, when we talk about that new commandment, when we talk about our loyalty and allegiance to God above all things, we can't separate that from the topic of love. And you know why? Because Jesus is love. And just so you know, even when the law comes down heavy, even when the weight of that first uh, commandment weighs so heavily upon us and our hearts, when we realize that we failed to live it out, it's important to always remember who this Jesus is. In fact, it's important to remember that if you have those thoughts of Jesus being angry with you or that he's somehow mad at you, it's important to think again because he's not mad at you. He is absolutely madly in love with you. 
That's why we can defend our faith, stand on the truth, ward off the attacks of the enemy, do it all faithfully and steadfastly. But if we have not love, we need to be called back into it. In fact, that's what Paul writes about, right? In fact, Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Which means that Paul is speaking and talking to that new commandment that Jesus gave us. And what it means to really be a Christ follower, not just a fan. This is that love that's demonstrated in all that we say and do, even when we're standing firm in the truth and defending the hope that we have. And you remember how Jesus put it on the night when he was betrayed? He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So I think it's important to be clear about something at this point. Something that I discovered a long time ago is that wearing your Lions jersey or your Packers jersey or whatever jersey it is that you choose to wear doesn't really mean that somebody is all in, does it? Simply going to the game does not guarantee that somebody's all in. In fact, being a fan is never enough. And like it or not, fans aren't even on the field to play or in the game. They're just bystanders. They're just watching. No, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're called to actively be participants, to be on the field, which means that if we're serious about this first commandment things, to put God first, to love him above all things, then we have to be just as serious about new commandment things, to love one another as Jesus has loved us, even that person that you really don't like to talk to. The two can never be separated because they go hand in hand. And I think it's important that we never lose sight of this because this demonstrates who we are and whose we are, which, by the way, is the theme of Lutheran North next door. In fact, this is how others know that we are more than just fans of Jesus. This is how others will know that we are followers of Jesus Christ by living out the love that he poured out richly over us through the cross, covering all our sin, washing all our sin away, even those times when we've lived just as fans and bystanders, and then drafting us through his blood, drafting us onto a team that bears the same sin-forgiving love and lasts forever. You see, when it comes to what allegiance really looks like to God, this discussion never happens apart from Jesus Christ. Without his never wavering life of faithfully demonstrating his allegiance, allegiance like no other, and a love that can never be matched, this conversation never happens. Without Jesus' sacrificial death in order to remove that sin that seeks to hold us back, we're never talking about this. This message would lack any meaning. And without Jesus' resurrection, the enemy would still be able to convince us that we're nothing more than seasonal fans who are destined to remain on the sidelines. Without the love and the promises of God that were sealed in and through Jesus, who is love, this conversation of what it means to be a Christ follower, it's non-existent. But thanks be to Jesus, the one who is love, that we get to have this conversation. Thanks be to Jesus, the one who is love, that we get to talk about this. We get to ponder it. We get to dive into it in his word. Thanks be to Jesus that he makes clear that we've been drafted onto his team And the victory is ours. You see, the very fact that Jesus calls us back to who we are as his children is evidence that he's never, ever willing to lay low or pull back on the love that he has for you and for me. I was reminded of this growing up, at least in in some way I was reminded by my father. 
My father used to tell me when he would get on my case, and sometimes I needed somebody to get on my case, he'd say, look, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't say anything. And in my mind, I was going, I wish you wouldn't love me, so you wouldn't say anything. But the bottom line is, he was making the point. And as I grew older and older, I realized the same is true with our Savior Jesus, who handles it in a better, in a more perfect way. The very fact that he calls us to repentance, as he did with the early church of Ephesus, who again were exhibiting some great, great qualities, is yet another reminder that he is far from ever being done with us as his people. And even better than that, it's the very fact that he once again reminds us of the heavenly reward that awaits all of us because of his victory, because there is nothing that will separate us from his love. After all, if Jesus did not love us, would he bother calling us back to who we are? If we weren't really his children, would he bother sending us this message? But oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you so much. And how he's loved you since before you were formed. And how he will never stop loving you. Oh, how he has demonstrated the vastness of his love by dying as a ransom to pay the debt of our sin once and for all, and then by rising from that grave to restore your life and my life forever. Oh, how he loves you. And the proof is in the fact that he's claimed you as his own. I pray that this is always something that we are called back to each and every day that has all to do with his great love, the love that he has for you and me, and then that call to live out that love, to wear that love from the inside out as his followers, which, by the way, is the best way to demonstrate our true allegiance to the one who is the king of kings and our dear friend and brother, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Jesus. Amen. At this this time, we have an opportunity to return our gifts to God in thanksgiving. Please stand.
Before we start the prayers, I want to invite each and every one of you to take a bulletin home with you. There is a list of names in there, and I invite you to pick out a name and pray for somebody this week. As we begin, Father in heaven, we thank you first and foremost for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that what he has done is the ultimate answer to all of our prayers and the ultimate deliverance from all of our problems, knowing and believing this, while we await his reappearance, we pray for the following. For healing for Andrea Tisch from stomach cancer. For healing for Lucy Roncilio, as well as healing and hope for all who are upon our list and all who weigh heavily upon our hearts and our minds. We pray, pray for healing us, body, mind, soul, and spirit as well as we lift up before you those who are hospitalized, Lloyd Heck, we pray for his healing and a speedy recovery, as well as we pray for those who are undergoing surgery, like Dolores Elliott, we pray that you watch over the nurses, doctors, and anesthetists so that this surgery is successful and there is complete healing and full recovery for Dolores. As well as we lift up before you the congregation of St. John Apostle Catholic Church in Clinton Township. We pray that as they elect new leadership and start Bible studies, that through all this, God will be glorified. We also pray and remember all those events in 9-11. We pray for those who are still affected by it. We pray also that as these things happen, we remember who you are, and we draw closer to you, Heavenly Father. As well as we lift up thanksgiving to you for the birthdays of Barbara Schmidt, Claudia King, Joyce Gosdor, Carol Beck, and Truman Kraft. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these people you put in our lives and the blessing they are to each and every one of us. As well as we thank you for the wedding anniversaries of Gary and Shirley Cryer and Kurt and Adele King, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that precious gift of marriage where two become one. And we pray a blessing upon all of our marriages. We pray a blessing upon the marriage of McKenna Schramm and Matthew Cook that will be happening next week. Pray that through all this, the two that are married will become one. And all these things, whatever else you know that we need, we pray that you grant it through your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Join me for the prayer that our Lord and our Savior gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.